All right, everybody. So this is the long-awaited series on ringing and tones. And there's way too much to cover in one video, so we're going to do a bunch of shorter ones focusing on smaller topics. I should mention right off the top that depending on what country and locality you're from, the tones that you hear on your telephone will sound different. So since I'm from the US, this series will focus on North American sounds in particular. Also, I want to stress that there's an incredible amount of variation in electromechanical telephone signaling equipment, so I can't possibly cover everything with every specific variation, but I can talk about what I know. Before we dive into the ringing and tone machine, let's get ourselves oriented historically. The set of tones that you hear while placing a call are generally known as call progress tones, and the system of applying these tones and managing the state of your telephone line is called subscriber line-side signaling. This signaling encompasses all of the various intentional sounds that tell you what's happening with your phone call and all of the different states that your telephone can be in. Back in the early days of manual operators, the network didn't really use any tones because it didn't need them. Telephone users had a real live human being there to tell them if the line they called was busy or they had the wrong number or anything like that. The first use of mechanically generated sound to convey meaning in the context of telephones was Thomas Watson's thumper. In the very earliest telephone systems, users just had to shout loudly to try to get the attention of the party they wished to speak to. This obviously didn't work well, so in 1877, Watson invented this device. And this is wild, get this. The thumper was a hammer on the caller's telephone that struck the diaphragm of the transmitter, which produced a loud thumping sound in the receiver, which was hopefully loud enough to alert the called party that someone wanted to speak with them. This actually didn't work well, and the thumper idea didn't last long. So shortly after, Watson decided instead to use a magneto and a pair of bells to signal that a call was incoming. The concept of a telephone ringer is pretty easy to understand. Although there's differences in how they're constructed, they pretty much all follow the same basic idea. H here. See, it's just a pair of gongs with a striker in the middle. Then there's these two magnets that the ringing current passes through. That's usually 90 volts AC at 20 hertz, although it can sometimes differ, like with frequency ringing on party lines. Anyway, when the voltage is positive, the clapper moves this way and strikes this gong. And when the voltage is reversed, the clapper moves the other way and strikes the other gong. Reverse that 20 times a second, and you end up with sounds. This is all well and good, but in order to ring these bells, we need a way of generating the voltage necessary and sending it out on the telephone line. And in the early days of the telephone, we use magnetos to accomplish this. They're actually delightfully simple but ingenious devices, and they take advantage of that thing where a coil of wire spinning through a magnetic field generates power. And through the magic of having two of them, I can show you the inside. See, there's a coil of wire here that spins when I turn this crank. Now, if we place these horseshoe magnets around the spinning coil of wire, a voltage will be induced. And if we hook up a ringer to the wire, then it rings. Using this fancy oscilloscope, we can see the voltage generated by the magneto isn't perfectly sinusoidal. But it's close enough, and the bells really don't care anyway, as long as the peak voltage is high enough to wiggle the magnet. Magnetos weren't just used for ringing bells. Early telephone systems didn't use a central power supply like we're used to today. Instead, each telephone had its own batteries inside to power the transmitter. But there was no DC voltage shared between the phone and the central office, so you couldn't just lift the receiver off the hook to signal the operator. In modern telephones, lifting the receivers is almost the same as turning on a switch. There's always voltage in the wires, and when we flip the switch, we close a circuit so that voltage can pass through the lights or whatever else we want to turn on. In the same way, 
Lifting the receiver off the hook switch closes a DC circuit between the central office and your telephone, which, in the old days, lit a lamp at the operator's switchboard, telling her you wanted to make a call. But in local battery magneto systems, there wasn't any voltage on your telephone line while you were on hook. If a caller wanted to attract the attention of an operator, they had to turn the magneto crank on their phone, which generated alternating current. This AC passed through the phone's internal transformer easily and was received at the exchange where it operated a device known as a drop at the switchboard. This drop is what told the operator that you wanted to place a call. And it's kind of wild to think that ringing was the primary way of signaling on the network, regardless of whether it was from an operator to a subscriber or the other way around. And when a caller was finished with their call, they couldn't just hang up either. Again, there was no direct current signaling loop between the caller and the switchboard, so the operator didn't know the state of the call unless she somehow plugged into each jack and listened. When your call was done, you had to ring off. This involved hanging up and cranking your magneto one more time, which operated another drop back at the switchboard to let the operator know you were done. This worked pretty well for exchanges in the early days, but it had several drawbacks. For one thing, batteries had to be provided for each and every telephone customer at great expense to the telephone companies. The phone companies had to send out workers to replace these batteries in every subscriber phone several times a year. Secondly, both operators and callers spent a lot of time cranking away at their magnetos. So, when it became technically and economically feasible, telephone companies began to switch away from magneto systems to common battery systems, where the batteries were moved out of the individual telephones and into the central office. This saved tons of money and was a crucial step in the evolution of signaling. There's a bunch of technical challenges when implementing a common battery system. For one thing, each telephone subscriber is sharing the same power source. And this can have unexpected consequences, like crosstalk. Crosstalk happens when one conversation leaks over into another, and pretty soon everybody can hear everyone else. In all common battery systems, including modern ones, the battery supply has to be filtered before it reaches each telephone, so conversations don't leak into one another. In the earliest common battery systems, they had huge choke coils, or inductors, in the battery plant to filter out the voice frequency AC while allowing the DC power through. Some of these coils were absolute units, weighing up to 4,000 pounds. Starting in the 1920s, they switched to using smaller coils for smaller groups of circuits that were mounted on frames instead of huge ones on the floor. There were other complications around using common battery, but it's safe to say for now that these were overcome as technology advanced. The next thing to do was to take care of those operators. See, as long as they were spending their time manually ringing someone's phone, that was time they were not spending handling other calls. So out with the magnetos and in with this. This is a ringing generator designed in the 1910s, and it's basically a magneto with a motor attached. This was used with small to mid-sized switchboards and provided the ringing power so the operator didn't have to do it herself. Versions of this machine ran on whatever power was available, including ones that were powered directly from a water wheel. It was part of a larger system that included power control and distribution circuits, and sometimes circuits to apply and cut off the ringing automatically. It just plugs into regular single phase AC power, and if I hook a bell to it, it rings. It's also got this cute little spring coupling between the motor and the magneto, and I just love it so much. I mean, just look at it. Boing, 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 boing. It's important to remember that history doesn't exist in a straight line. In all of these developments, there wasn't a single step that led to the next thing and the next thing. 
It's more of an interconnected web of ideas that came into being along a common timeline. So to characterize the development of common battery systems like it's a series of sequential events is only a half truth. It's convenient for an educational video, but the actual truth is much more interesting. The real story is that many of these things existed simultaneously. Manual switchboards and ringing machines, magnetos and common battery. There was no single person who just magically brought these ideas into being. Rather, it was a group of people, sometimes working together and sometimes not, using what they had available at the time to create something better. This is an even larger and more complex ringing machine designed to provide features for a large central office. And right here in the center, a magneto. Here, you've got your spinning coil of wire, and out here, you have an electromagnet, excited by these additional coils here. And because we can't afford to hire someone to stand here and spin it by hand, we have not one, but two motors, a mains powered AC motor and a 48 volt DC motor as a backup. These two motors don't run at the same time. The AC motor runs continuously until there's a power failure, and then the DC motor starts up and carries the ringing load until power is restored. To the right of the ringing generator is the tone alternator. This produces many of the tones you hear in your receiver when you place a call, like dial tone, busy tone, and others. When you hear a phone freak talk about city ring or the sound of a city tone plant, this is the part they're talking about. This also provides the voltage to handle coin collect and return for payphones, and it has even more equipment to provide timing signals needed for running a central office. I think it's wild that this technology developed in the early 1900s was used pretty much unchanged for the next 60 years or so. And in the next video, we'll talk about this machine and go into detail about how it works. I'll also take you on a trip across the country as we go and search of a complete ringing and tone plant for our museum. In the meantime, remember to like and subscribe, and thanks for watching.